Well, hey, good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Good. Hey, I am so excited to be with you guys. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, maybe you've seen me in passing, maybe you've seen me out in the lobby with my family. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm the new youth pastor here at Pathways, uh, and I'm excited to be here. I'm excited. Thank you, Hannah. That's one of my students. She's awesome. Hey, but before I get into anything, I wanted you guys to kind of get to know me a little bit. So you guys know my heart, know where uh, I'm coming from. So first off, this is my family right here. Uh, the homeless looking dude right there, that's me. Um, this is my wife, Savannah. Uh, I love her. She's absolutely awesome. Um, one of my favorite things about her is she has a heart for people that is just unmatched. Um, she's also really, really good at telling you you're not good at something. Um, she's so kind to the point where it's like, Okay, let me tell you how kind she is. She's so kind to the point where she can tell you that you're doing something wrong or bad, and you're like, oh, thank you, that's really nice of you, right? Um, you know, she'll come up to me while I'm doing dishes and be like, Michael, why don't, you just, why don't you just go watch the boys for a little bit, right? And I'll go, okay, and I walk away, and all of a sudden I realize like, oh, I was doing a bad job at doing dishes, right? <laughs> She's absolutely awesome, and uh, she is like the best example, like, you know, I'm a pastor and I work at a church, uh, but she does an amazing job at showing, uh, showing my boys Jesus every single day. And I, I am just indebted to the way that she does that. So these are my boys. This is Liam. He is two and a half and we are in the stage of no. Um, we are in the stage of I'm going to run away from you. Um, and it's super fun, though. i am really been enjoying this stage. Uh, my parents have been enjoying telling me that that's what I was like as a kid. Um, and then we have Levi here. He was born in October, and when this dude starts moving, we are going to be in trouble. Okay, this dude, he sees his brother do something, and he's like, all right, I got to do that, too. Like, I've got to figure out how I can do that, even though I'm not mobile. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is my crew. Uh, we're actually originally from Fond du Lac. So we're originally from this area. We moved away for a while, and, and now we're, we're back here, and we're excited to be back. Grandma and Grandpa are excited to have the kids back with them. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but there's something about a Lake Winnebago fish fry that just... It screams home, you know, that it screams home for me and I absolutely uh, love it. But I'm also really excited to be a part of what Pathways is doing. I'm excited for uh, what we're doing at Pathways Students. For those of you who don't know, we have a youth ministry here at Pathways and it's about 60 kids that meet every single Wednesday in the basement of this church and pursue Jesus. The next generation of, of Christ followers is being built up down there, and you should see the way they worship, the way they praise. It is absolutely incredible to watch. And so I would encourage, if you have a, a student, come talk to me. I'd love to see how we can partner with you as a parent. Uh, and, and lastly, before we, we actually get into to what we're talking about today, I wouldn't be a youth pastor if I didn't plug something that I believe is absolutely awesome, and that is our camp that is coming up here July 16th through 19th. Uh, this is going to be an incredible week uh, for our 6th through 12th graders, an incredible time of, of worship and teaching and just hanging out, rock climbing, swimming, you name it, we're going to do it, and it's going to be incredible. And you can sign up online, go to pathwayschurch.us slash events, and you can learn all about it, or just find me in the lobby, and I'd love to talk to you. Uh, but this is also where I need to thank you guys, because this church believes in next gen. This church believes in what this, the children's ministry and the youth ministry are doing. And, and one of my dreams as a pastor, as a youth pastor, is to see, see an environment built up where kids can bring their friends and they can meet Jesus. That's, that's like one of the biggest areas of my heart. And so I actually, Michelle and I had a conversation and said, hey, what would, what would be the dream for camp? And it would be that kids could bring a friend at no cost. And you guys stepped up. There are people from this church that stepped up. And because of that, our students can bring a friend that has never that that is on church. Maybe they go to a different church, and they can meet Jesus. How incredible! Give yourselves a round of applause for that. That is incredible, and we're excited for what God's going to do with that. Uh, that being said, I'm excited as we are getting into not the last week. I I, I kind of made a mistake last week. This isn't the last week. We have one more one more week of Acts, uh, but we are in a series uh, called Supernatural. And we're looking at the Holy Spirit as well as what was happening in the early church. And if you've missed it, I'd encourage you to go back. Go back in the archives between now and next Sunday. There's six days. There are six sermons. Perfect, right? You just go back and watch one a day, and you'll be all caught up on what is happening. Uh, but you see, last week, we, we were introduced to the, the lead character of who we're going to be talking about today. And it's a man by the name of Stephen. Uh, if you're a Nacho Libre fan like myself and my son, it's Stephen. 
Um, if you don't get Nacho Libre, you're not going to get that, and that's, that's fine. Uh, but we met Stephen in, in Acts 6, verse 5. He was one of the seven, if, if you remember from last week. And, and this is what it said about him. They chose Stephen. He was a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going we're gonna to get into this central character of, of Acts 7 and his life and his ministry and his teaching. But before we do, let's pray. Let's usher the Holy Spirit into this moment, uh, and, and then we'll get into it. Cool? Awesome. Let's do this. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for what you're going to do today. God, I thank you for the word that you have for us. God, I pray that I would just be this broken vessel, God. That as you pour into me, that my weaknesses, my cracks, God, that you would pour out of them, that you'd show people Jesus through my brokenness, through my weakness, God. We just ask that your Holy Spirit would move and that you'd have something for every single person that walked into this room and that is joining us online today. In your precious name we pray, amen. So how many of you guys like filling up, filling up your gas tank? Anybody? Nobody, right? I hate filling up my gas tank. Like, it's a little bit extreme. It's almost the extreme. Uh, for example, this past week, my uh, gas gauge light came on on Monday on my way to work. Um, I didn't fill it up until Wednesday night. Uh, and that was because I knew that if I didn't fill it up, I would be on the side of the road. Like, I fill it up at the last possible moment. It's actually caused a little friction at times in my marriage with Savannah. I remember uh, a time very, very early in our marriage. We'd been married for, I think, less than, less than three months. Um, and and we, were, we were actually heading out of town to go somewhere, and the gas gauge came on, right? And I don't know, for those of you who are like me, I don't know if, if your spouses are the opposite, but we are opposites. Okay, so the gas, Savannah, as gas light comes on, we're pulling in. Like, we're going to fill this thing up, we're going to be done, right? Michael's like, oh, we can make it. I know the car, right? I know the car, but we're good, right? And so the gas light comes on as we're heading out of town, and, and I'm like, oh, we'll just pick it up a little later, a little later. And we pass the gas station, and Savannah goes, you just pull in. Why don't you just pull in and fill it up? We're going to have to fill it up anyways. I'm like, oh, no, we'll be fine, right? So we pass not one, not two, not three, but four gas stations. And every single time, my wife says, pull in, pull in, you need gas, you need to pull in, pull in right now, come on, right? And she's getting a little bit more frustrated at me. Right? And I'm like, oh, no, it's fine. We'll be okay, right? 150 yards after the fourth gas station, my car stops working. <laughs> right? So I pull over, and I'm sitting there. I put it into, into park, and the, the car is silent. And I look over at my wife, and I know what she's thinking. She's, she's thinking, I told you so. Right? I, I told you so. I told you you should have pulled in there. See, the, the reality is that for a lot of us, when we hear truth, we don't necessarily want to hear that and we don't want to do anything about it, right? Even if it's truth, even if it's going to save us, we don't want to hear any of that, right? That, that's not stuff that we want to hear. And so today we're going to get into Stephen. And the reason that I wanted to start that way is because Stephen is a man who speaks a lot of truth regardless of who it offends and regardless of who it hurts, and so we're going we're gonna to get into that. Before we do, I want to give you a little bit of backstory uh, and kind of show you who Stephen was and, and what he was doing, right? So Acts 6, 8 says this. Now, Stephen is a man full of God's grace and power, and he performed great wonders and signs among the people. And it continues on to say this. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as well as, as it was called, um, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the province of Sicilia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, right? So Stephen is out here and he's telling truth. He's telling people about Jesus, right? He's telling, telling people about all these wonderful signs and, and what Jesus came to do. And he's making people mad, right? You speak truth, you're probably gonna make some people mad, right? So there's these four groups, like it's not just one, like he makes everybody mad apparently. So there's these four groups that are just super mad at Stephen. And so as a result, they're like, you know what, we're gonna arrest him. We're gonna, we're gonna figure out a way to charge him and arrest him. And so they have him arrested and taken to the Sanhedrin. Now, if you don't know what the Sanhedrin is, it's like the Jewish court of law, okay? This is the same, same body that they took Jesus before, before he was crucified, right? And so that's where they have him here. And we pick it up in verse 13. It says this, they produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law, continues on in 14. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. Now I want to stop for a second because there's five accusations that are made here that, that are pretty important because they tell us what Stephen was teaching. They tell us what he was actually saying that was offending them. And, and really it's five accusations. The first one is, is that Jesus is greater than Moses, 
okay? Jesus is greater than Moses. You have to understand that for these Jewish people, Moses was the great deliverer, right? He brought him, if you go back to Exodus, he brought him out of slavery. And so when Stephen is up there saying, you know what? Moses, he may, may have brought you out of slavery. Jesus brought you to slavery from sin. That's something that absolutely offends the people. It's truth, but it offends the people. The second thing we see is this, that Jesus was God. He's preaching that Jesus was God, which if you are a Jewish person, you're not gonna be too happy about that because we just killed Jesus, right? That's not great, right? The third thing we see is this, that Jesus was greater than the temple. Now, this takes a little bit more explaining, but you see, the Old Testament, because of the fact that we still were not, we were not covered by God's grace because of our sin, we couldn't be in the presence of God, right? If you were in the presence of God, you were in trouble. And so the presence of God was limited to the temple, right? It was limited to the Ark of the Covenant and to the temple. But when Jesus came and he covered us in his grace by dying on the cross and rising again for our sins, we now can be in his presence. And so what Stephen was teaching was, look, we don't need the temple anymore because God's Holy Spirit has come to rest on us and we can have him in our hearts. We no longer need the temple. The next thing he, he was teaching was this, that Jesus was the fulfillment of the law. What he was telling Jewish people is, look, here's the deal. You know all those laws and rules that you follow from the Old Testament? You don't have to follow those anymore because Jesus came. He brought relationship, and so we don't need that anymore. And finally, he, he taught this, that Jesus was greater than their customs and their religious traditions. He taught that all of these things that, we, we, that they used to be doing, that they didn't need that anymore because Jesus was here. Jesus came and because he came, the Holy Spirit is here, it's moving, it's active. And so all these things are truths, but all these things give us a picture of why the Jewish people were so enraged by what he was saying, even if it was truth. And so we see chapter seven start here. It says this, then the high priest asked Stephen, are these charges true? Right, this is your few good men moment, right? You can just feel the tension in this courtroom as they, the, the priests come to Stephen and say, hey, are these things actually true? Is what they said true about you? And so Stephen's reply here is actually one of the longest speeches we see in Acts, but he does the equivalent of Israel's Facebook memories. Okay, he kind of takes them through their history from Abraham all the way up until Jesus came. And for those of you who don't know what Facebook memories are, basically uh, on the social media platform, uh, it shows you what you posted a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, all the way back to the beginning of Facebook, right? And these can be really good or they can be really bad, right? I mean, for example, this is, uh, this is a picture of my wife. This was like days after Levi was born. And this picture came up the other day for me and it was just like this amazing moment for me where I can remember watching my wife become a mom for the first time. Like what a great memory to have. What a great memory to be brought up on a random Tuesday, right? But the problem is there's also moments that are kind of cringy, right? There are moments that we don't wanna remember at all. Like, like this one here, Fight Club, right? <laughs> Fight, no, I'm, I'm kidding, it wasn't Fight Club. No, this is the result of a softball to the face, line drive to the face, right? Uh, eight stitches and I couldn't see out of that eye for a little bit. Uh, this is a cringe moment. This is a moment that I don't want to live through again. I'm good, like, I, I don't need to see that. That doesn't need to pop back up on a random Tuesday. I, I'm good. And I'm sure there's been moments in your life where you'd say the same exact thing. That, that if you brought up that moment, maybe it was even this past year, you'd go, oh, man, I, I don't want to relive that. Maybe it was a mistake you made. Maybe it was something that was out of your control, but you still don't want to remember it. See, what Stephen does is he holds up this mirror, right? He holds up this mirror, and, and, and he shows this constant cycle that the Jewish people have been living in their entire lives, going back to Abraham. And, and the cycle, it looks a little bit like this. The first thing we see is that God provides, right? If we go back to Exodus, we see manna and quail from heaven, right? He provides for the Jewish people. The second thing we see is that they become complacent, right? They become complacent with the way that God is providing for them, and that leads to their, the, the third thing, and that's this, God sends a messenger. Over and over again, if you look through the Old Testament, you will find moments where God sends a messenger to say, hey, look, what you're doing is going to kill you. What you're doing is going to hurt you. You are pulling yourself away from God. Stop what you're doing. And over and over again in the Old Testament, we see that they persecute the messenger. Time and time and time again, they, they just, they persecute him. 
And after they persecute them, they experience rough times, right? The thing that the messenger said, hey, stop doing because it's gonna lead to this, happens every single time, right? And finally, the people repent and it comes back to the top. And it's this cycle that is going over and over and over and over again. You see, what Stephen is trying to tell the Jewish people through this speech and through this long monologue is that Jesus came to change it all. That you guys have been living in this cycle over and over again and your religious brokenness and your religious traditions and customs and your system has been in a circle your entire lives. But Jesus came to break you out of that circle. He came to break you completely out of it. And so after Stephen takes this court through all of this history, he, he ends it with this in verse 51. You stiff-necked people. Uh, that's a great place to start, right? You stiff-necked people. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You were just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Time and time again, they were resisting the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet that your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed the one who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you betrayed and murdered him. And finally, he ends it with this. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. You see, time and time again, we see this over and over again in the Old Testament. And I know this sounds harsh, right? You read that and you're like, okay, this Stephen dude, like, he's a mean dude. Like, he's super harsh, right? But what we have to understand is that Stephen here, he's operating, he's operating out of obedience, He's operating out of obedience to the Holy Spirit that's telling him, hey, this is what they need to hear. Simply what what Stephen is saying is that there's these two different sides, that on one side you have obedience, which is Stephen, right? He's obeying the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit has to say. And then on the other side, you have these, these, basically these religious people that want to have it their way, that have created their own system, their own God, and they they just follow what they want to do when they resist change at any, any side, And really what Stephen was coming to say was, look guys, we don't need religion anymore. This religious tradition, the customs, all of this stuff, we don't need that because God has come to earth. And because God has come to earth, we don't need that. We have relationship. We can walk in obedience and and have relationship with the God of the universe. We don't need this anymore. You see guys, this is something I really want you to catch here. Religion requires perfection. Requires you to be perfect in the eyes of other people, perfect in the eyes of of everyone around you. But relationship requires obedience. And that's what he was trying to say here. This is what Stephen was getting at, was you can have relationship. You don't need the the religious customs and traditions you used to have. And so we hear, here we see God used to speak truth to the Jewish people. And we see how they respond here in, in verse 54. It says this, When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelled at the top of their voices and they all rushed him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. You know, as I was preparing for, for this message, you know, it kind of struck me, because usually when we, we do a message on Stephen, uh, and, and traditionally in, in a church setting, this is usually what happens, we go, hey, we want to speak truth, that regardless of the consequences, we want to be the people that are speaking truth and saying stuff that, that might hurt people's feelings, but it's truth and it shows people Jesus. And that was kind of the direction I thought I was going to go, but as I prayed and, and sought God's face and his Holy Spirit and, and began to study, there was... There was this couple phrases that caught me as I read through the text. And those phrases were, they covered their ears and yelled at the top of their voices. See, they were so resistant to hearing the Holy Spirit and hearing truth that they covered their ears and said, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear this because it hurts me. You see, everybody wants to identify with Stephen. Everybody wants to be the person bringing truth, right? That that makes us feel good. I mean, nobody wants to be a villain, (laughs) I've never seen any kid that watches Lion King and goes, I want to be Scar. Like, no, nobody wants to do that, right? We want to identify with Stephen. We want to be the people bringing the truth. But I guess the question that that came to my mind was, what is my response when God shows me the errors of my ways? What's my response 
when the Holy Spirit begins to prompt me and says something the way that Stephen did to the people. And like I said, I've got a two and a half year old kid and he gets into everything. And the other day I was making coffee. I had my, my French press set up with all my grounds and was boiling water on the stove. And, and as I turned to, to do something else, I saw my son come running past me and start to reach up for the stove out of the, the corner of my eye. And immediately I reacted and I smacked his hand away because I knew that that would, that would hurt him. That would seriously burn him, if not kill him. And Liam looked up at me and he looked me in the eyes and there was almost a disgust on his face. He grabbed his hand and he looked at me and he went running off to his mom. And you see, as his dad, I was, I was kind of frustrated with his response because I was like, Liam, I am trying to protect you here. I am trying to keep you safe. This is going to hurt you. This could kill you if you do this. And his response was offense. His response was, you hurt me. And it sounds silly when I look at his response, but when I put myself in that position, I put God in my place, my reaction looks the same. That the times in my life when, when truth, when it's uncomfortable, has been spoken over my life, my reaction is to get offended and turn. My reaction is to, to stop listening and yell at the top of my lungs so I don't have to hear what was said. So what's our response when God shows us the error of our ways? I want to take a moment and I want us to ask ourselves that question. I want you to go back to the last time that somebody said something that was offensive and uncomfortable to you. But it was truth. And you knew it was truth. Maybe it was Adam. Maybe Adam gave a sermon and it just rubbed you the wrong way. Or maybe, maybe it was that friend. That friend that came to you and said, hey, look, what you're doing, you got to stop that. What was your reaction? How did you react? What, 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 was, what was the first thing that came to your mind? Because I know for me, I'm, I'm not trying to pick any, on anyone here. I know for me, my first reaction is, honey, grab the kids, we're leaving this church. I'm out, I'm done. We're not doing this anymore. It's, you know what? You can't speak over my life anymore. I, I know you're my friend and all, but you said something that hurt me deeply, and so because you said that, I'm done. I'm out, you don't have a say. I don't know what it is for you, but I'm just telling you that that's what it is for, for me. And I'm not saying that you should do this for everybody and let anybody who speaks to you and anybody who says something that offends you or, or, or hurts you actually have weight in your life. But I'm saying when somebody comes to you with love in their heart and says, look, what you're doing is hurting you. What you're doing is killing you. What you're doing right now, it's gonna destroy your marriage. What you're doing right now, it's gonna push away your kids. What is our reaction? And I've, I've kind of gone through and, and tried to think, what are, what are some, some good validity tests to see what's truth and what's just people picking on us, right? And, and so I came up with, the, with these three thoughts that I, I want you to, when truth is spoken over your life, I want you to run them past these three things. The first one is, this, is it backed by scripture? Look at Stephen, his claims were backed by scripture. Is the truth that was just spoken over your life, is it backed by scripture? The second thing is this, is it because of love? You know, like me, me, me telling my son, hey, what you're doing is gonna kill you, it's gonna hurt you, that's because I love him, it's not because I wanna hurt him. My wife coming to me while we're in the car and saying, fill up the car, it's because of love. It's, it's not because she, she wants to pick on me. Is the truth that's spoken because of love? And the third thing is this, is it based in truth? Is the statement that was said over years, is it actually true over your life or is it not? Now you notice something, something I want you to notice is none of these things say it's comfortable. Because truth is not comfortable. I'm sorry guys, it's not. There's rarely a time where you're gonna find that truth is comfortable. In fact, 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17 has something to say about this. This is what it says. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Teaching, rebuking, correcting, training. None of those things are comfortable. They're not. I, I, I know for sure because I have sat at the kitchen table with my dad trying to do math as a kid. Teaching's not fun. It's just not, right? Rebuking, you ever been rebuked? That's not fun. Correcting, that's not fun. Training, anybody who's tried to train for like a half marathon or a big event, they can tell you it's not fun. 
None of those things are fun. But we need truth in our lives because truth is going to lead us to be thoroughly equipped. Truth is going to lead us to be thoroughly thoroughly equipped, but it's also going to lead us to a place. It's going to lead us to a place, guys, where we're actually saved from ourselves. Truth is meant to challenge us. It's meant to ground us. It's meant to refine us. It's meant to mature us. It's meant to make us more, look more like Jesus. You see, truth is a scalpel that in the hands of the Holy Spirit can be used to cut out the sin that is entangling our lives. And that leaves me with one question, and it's this. I want you to take a moment, and I want you to actually think about this. Don't, don't just give yourself the, the past and be like, oh, yeah, that's fine. That's, that's me. All right, Whatever. I want you to honestly think about your life and think about those those interactions you had with, maybe it was a sermon, maybe it was this sermon, maybe it was Adam's sermon, maybe it was a friend. Think about the last truth that was spoken over your life and ask yourself this question right here. Are you actually open to truth? Do you want to be trained? Do you want to be corrected? Do you want to be made to look more like Jesus? Or are you just holding on to what you want? When you honestly look at your life, do you look more like Stephen that is obeying and in step with the Holy Spirit or do you look like this crowd of hypocrites that is sitting there and covering their ears because they want what they've had. They want their traditions. They want their religion. They want the image of God that they've created that's comfortable. They want their idols. You see, just like the Jewish people, we're all stuck in a cycle. We're all stuck in a cycle that we just keep going round and round. Where we say, you know what? We don't want to, we don't want to listen to truth. We don't want to obey the Holy Spirit. And so we hold on to what we want. Right? We, we, we try to change our lives through behavior modification and we end up at a place where we're just going in a circle. M- maybe for you it's that sin you keep on coming back to. You tell yourself, never again. But you end up back in the same exact place. Maybe it's that addiction that you told yourself you'd never get into, that you had it under control, but you see, every time it comes back over and over and over again. See, if we're just coming and we're sitting in a a chair on Sunday mornings and we're trying to rely on our own perfection, our own religiousness, our own traditions to save us, they're not. We are going to live in a circle where we try to change our lives and we never do. But if we actually embrace the Holy Spirit and say, you know what, I'm going to obey, even when it's truth, even when it hurts, even when it, it, it feels like it's offensive, we're going to obey. So the power of the Holy Spirit then allows truth to enter your life and equip you and train you and cut out the stuff that is killing you. Cut out the stuff that's keeping you stuck in this cycle over and over and over again. Maybe for you, it's, it's that the Holy Spirit's been leading you to serve somewhere. And every time you go, no, I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm not comfortable with that. Maybe for you, it's to take that next step of baptism. In, in two weeks, we're gonna have a, a baptism service here and I, I encourage you to go to our website and check out all the information on that if you're interested. But maybe for some of us, when you hear me talk about this cycle and you you, you feel that. You felt that truth in your life, that, that, that you've been living in this cycle over and over again and trying to fix yourself. And this is the first time that you've heard the words Jesus and relationship in the same sentence. This is the first time you've been in a church service where they, they tell you that we don't want religion. We want relationship. If that's you, and you say, yes, I want that, I want to be in relationship with Jesus. Let me tell you what what Jesus has done for us. He came down, lived a life just of ours, died on a cross for your sins. Your good works can't get you there. In fact, it, it, it says in the book of Romans that our wages, what we've earned because of our action is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. See, Jesus came down and died for our sins and rose again so that we could have the Holy Spirit so we can walk in obedience, so we can have relationship with the God of this universe. And so with all of our our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if that's you, 
If you'd say, I'm done with this cycle, I'm done with living my own life, I'm done with this religion, I want Jesus. I want you to slowly raise your hand. Raise your hand up all across this place. We'll wait for you. Thank you, I see you. Thank you, I see you. I see you. I see you. Just wait another moment. I see you back there. I believe the Holy Spirit is still moving in this moment. I believe that there are people that need to be set free. That there are people that need to be set free from the behavior modification that they've thought would work and it never does. So if that's you, raise your hand. Now's the time to do that. Thank you. You guys can can open your eyes, raise your heads. We're just gonna pray together. We're gonna pray that that in this moment, that Jesus would come in this moment and fill us with the Holy Spirit. And because we don't pray alone, we're all gonna pray together. So let's pray. Father God, We thank you for what you did today. God, I thank you that you take our brokenness and you make it whole. God, I'm I'm sorry that I've tried to fix it on my own. I don't want empty religion. I want to step in step with your obedience. I want relationship with you. We love you, Jesus. In precious name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, church, can we give it up to those people that made that decision today? And for what God has done.